Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News Desk. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limne. Coming up this morning, looming governance crisis as several government ministries are left without political heads after Parliament's decision not to approve President Ekufado's ministerial nominees over anti LGBTQ Bill Rao. It was a decision that was premised on false basis. Because indeed, it is true that. Rate has been found and served on me the day before. We have details plus the standoff between the executive and the legislature as the Attorney General writes to the Speaker of Parliament declaring he had no basis to have suspended the approval of President Ekofuadu's nominees. Also, one in five persons in household population does not have enough drinking water. That's according to the Ghana Statistical Service, as it highlights disparities in access to water on World Water Day. And interest groups at the Joint East National Dialogue on the Free SHS express varying concerns and share experiences on quality of food with the Ministry of Education committing to making interventions to deal with a challenge. We'll bring you more on this. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Do stay for details. There's a looming governance crisis as several government ministries have been left without political leadership in what could cripple their effective management. This follows the decision of parliament not to approve 24 ministers and deputy ministers designates following the anti-LGBTQ bill row. The president's decision not to accept the bill passed by parliament because of injunction applications is the basis for parliament's reciprocal move. Parliamentary affairs correspondent Ministers of State and their deputies are the political heads of the various ministries and are in charge of political and policy directions and decisions. But the current political stalemate has left some critical ministries without substantive ministers or deputies. The Ministry of Tourism is currently without a substantive minister. The crucial Ministry for Sanitation and Water Resources is also without a substantive minister, even as government struggles to keep up with its promise to make Accra the cleanest city in Africa. The Environment Ministry has also been affected. The Gender Ministry, which was affected by Don Kabenya MP and the then Minister Sarah Ajuasafo's long absence, is also without a substantive minister. Perhaps the worst affected are the Ministries for Health, and information which are both without substantive ministers and deputies. Both health minister designate Dr. Bernardo Kuboy and his two nominated deputies are hanging in the balance, just as the information ministry, which Minister Kujo Ponkroma was transferred to works and housing, while his deputy Fatima Tuabuakar proposed to be promoted to become substantive minister, has also not yet received parliamentary approval. The greater Accra region is without a minister, just like the OT region. Attorney General Godfrey Yabo Adami says the Speaker, Alban Bagwin, had no basis to suspend the ministerial nominee's approval. I think that was a decision that was premised on false basis. Because indeed it is true that a rate had been found and served on me the day before. But it is certainly untrue and inaccurate for a contention to be made that the motion for injunction has been filed let that film pockets. And I read the statement that was read by the right of our speaker in Parliament yesterday. And he firmly premised his conclusion on the pendency of a motion for interim interlocutory injunction that has been filed by Mr. Dafemapo. And that is false. Because indeed, as far as I'm concerned, the only process that has been filed <coughs> in that action is a bare rate of summons. It is not even accompanied by a set of claim or case. Neither has there been filed an application for interlocutory injunction. So it's just a rate of someone that has been filed without more. And clearly, there was no basis. It is correct that in his rate of summons, 
he actually stated as one of the reliefs another of his secretary injunction. But that is inconsequential. It is not an application or a motion for a secretary injunction. It has no effect whatsoever. It is not binding on anybody. I have formally conducted a search in the register of the Supreme Court this morning. And I have the results of the search. And the results are quite clear. But Roxanne Nelson, the who filed the injunction application before the Supreme Court, has been firing back. The, the injunction application was submitted to the registry of the court yesterday and filed. So if the Attorney General claims that he's conducted a search, I'll be willing to see the content of that search. So you've answered one leg that is filed. Has it been served? At least he's I am not. I am not a bailiff of the court. I don't serve process. It's the court that serves. Okay. So I am yes. Yeah, so is the court that will establish that the process has been set or not? It's not parties who serve, and the AG knows. So, and he says that he, his search review that at least um, it may not have been served, and that the speaker may have been no, but, but that, for him to take he, that decision. Hold on, hold on. What baffles me is that that Teddy Dana is a party in this matter. Then he comes on radio and makes very spurious comments. I, 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 and I find it very offensive. He's the leader of the bar. He's the attorney general of the and minister of justice of the Republic of Ghana. He should stop this radio legal argument. The majority have signaled they may recall parliament for an emergency sitting to deal with the ministerial nominees and other standing government business. Unheard of. Um, never done. There's no precedent to that. So after today, um, I think the majority uh, caucus or the majority leadership we will sit because normally the government business comes from us and we'll be able to engage the speaker. And after we engage, then we'll see where we are going to go. Do back. you have intentions to recall parliament? I mean, to uh, write to the speaker that you want to recall parliament? It's within our rights, but at the moment we haven't gotten to, making, uh, to make such a firm decision that we actually want to call back parliament. But it is part of the options that we can be able to do. As this political crisis lingers on, Opinions differ on what impact this stalemate will have on the governance of the country. But what is clear, however, is that the decision-making in so many ministries will lag, which could affect the delivery of their mandate. Reporting for Joy News, Kwiku Asante. Following Joy News' documentary, Empty Plates, the free SHS promises promise, highlighting a major challenge of the availability and quality of food bedeviling the free SHS program. Interest groups at the Joy News National Dialogue have been expressing varying concerns and experiences with the Ministry of Education committing to making interventions to deal with the challenge. I'm more comfortable with citing my own examples, uh, which is very verifiable, and it is nothing new. I can tell you, for example, that as I speak, for example, that Apart from maize, I don't have anything now, currently, today, as I said, hey. that will feed, uh, that will feed, yes, I'm telling you, for and I'm mentioning this, I'm not mentioning school, I am mentioning my school. Last week, we last we received some food uh, stuff, and we got maize so much. We didn't receive rice. So I'm telling you that until yesterday, when I had to fall on my PTA to give me some rice, I just came from Accra Sunday. I was in Accra, and I was trying to find out what was happening. The students have been eating. They will eat TZ in the afternoon and eat TZ in the evening. Right. And don't forget that they will take cocoa because there is no Tom Brown. I don't have Tom Brown. I don't have Chocolo. They will take cocoa in, wow. the, in, the, in the morning. So it is maize, maize, maize issue. Now, one of the problems associated with this kind of thing is that, number one, the menu. There's nothing like menu in most of our schools now. You cannot study if you are hungry. You cannot study if you are disturbed about what you are going to eat as your next meal. So that's an issue there. And they need that right nutrition so that they can grow well. Again, for girl children, you know, every month the menstruation, so they may lose some blood. And therefore, they need their iron, the level of iron in their blood or their HBs to be high enough. And they will get these through the foods that they are eating at school. I mean, if they are in school, at school. So every meal that is offered to these children is an opportunity to 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 put them up there to be able to compete internationally feeding per student per day was costed at 5.04 so 5.5 cities 40, 40 per per, at the per, per head per head mm. 2017 and then as at that time 
the agreement was that 30% of that will be released to the schools as perishable. And I want to state here that the perishable include frozen items that we spoke about. And at that time, because of the price at the time and the cost of frozen items and uh, other protein, um, it is possible to purchase them at that time. But over the period, the same amount is what is being remitted to schools, even if it comes at all. One CD, 56 per West. One CD, 56 per West. West. Per, per student per day. day. That is three meals. That is what is being used to prepare three meals for them. He mentioned inflationary pressures because as government is talking about inflationary pressures, it has not transmitted into the release of funds to school. There are periods in other schools where you go to the dining and you have hot water and soup served as lunch. Hot water? And soup. And soup. Which means that, come with your gari. <laughs> no, I'm not going to mention that. Mm. No, definitely I won't mention that. Yes, we will solve it. That's why we are here. That's why we are here. No, I'm not learning claims. No, 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 no. Oh, hold no, no, on. You no, no. have your time. I would, I would Kwezi, mention. Kwezi, no, Kwezi, I won't Kwezi, mention that. We're having an investment. Yes. Kwezi, 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 are not getting sufficient food and balanced diet. It is a problem. I also have a son who is in first year. He came home, and when I saw him, I mistook him <laughs> for his hey. younger brother. <laughs> he had lost weight. <laughs> Look, oh, ask parents. This, these are the realities, and we shouldn't beat about the bush. Mm. He is the second son. The first son, he is in uh, university first year. Mm. He also went through similar. But clearly, the conditions seem to have deteriorated mm. in terms of the quality of the food and the quantity of the food. And there's documented evidence to show, even if we can deny what I am saying because I'm a politician, parents would bear me out. This is why parents have had to develop all kinds of means and strategies. I know of parents who are paying women in the vicinity of the schools that their wards are attending to feed them just because they are not getting enough food mm. or the food they are getting is of a, a very poor quality. Okay. We are not there as leadership because there are no challenges. No, that's not why we are here. We are there to provide intervention and particularly in, in situations where there are anomalies or challenges, we do, we do intervene. So, I mean, I, I find it quite surprising in a way. But of course, first of all, the assurance surprising is that... Surprising that? No, I'm coming. First of all, the assurance is that we, we are going to intervene to his school and even the entire England that he's described. But you see, there are 18 food items. By when? Uh, immediately. Immediately. It's, it's of immediate effect. Findings from the 2022 Ghana Demographic and Health Survey indicate that one in every five persons in Ghana did not have enough drinking water in the month preceding the survey. In the northern region, which recorded the highest percentage, one in every three persons did not have adequate drinking water, except of a monthly release by the Ghana Statistical Service uh, states. And I'll be sharing a set of that uh, with you. It's coming right on your screens, it reads in every five person in Ghana, in, in five, every five person in Ghana did not have enough drinking water in the month preceding the survey. And in the Northeast region where the regions with the next highest percentage that did not have enough drinking water the upper east region and ashanti regions recorded the lowest percentage of persons without drinking water in sufficient quantities with figures less than half those of the northern and ot regions nationally 6.5 percent of the population traveled more than 30 minutes round trip to obtain drinking water more than a quarter which is 27.5 percent of the 
population in the northeast region reported traveling more than 30 minutes to access water. The highest recorded followed by the northern region with 18.6% and upper west region 18.6%. Now three in every five uh, persons, which is 59.9% in Ghana, did not have water in their premises. Nine in every 10 persons, which stands at 89.8% in the Savannah region, did not have water on their premises. The highest recorded and 1.5 times higher than the national average. Northeast representing 86.5% and OT representing 83.5% have the second and third highest percentage of the population without water on their premises. Greater Accra 22.0% recorded the lowest percent of population without water in the premises. Volta region, 47.1%, is the only other region where less than half of the population does not have water on the premises. More than 90.0% of the population in the lowest wealth quantile, 93.6% uh, were without drinking water on their premises, more than five times the percentage recorded for those in the highest wealth quintile, which is represented 17.5%. Meanwhile, the Water Resources Commission is worried Ghana is witnessing a concerning drop in water quality attributed to land use activities, prompting urgent calls for collaborative action. Authorities are stressing the need to address destructive land practices to protect the nation's dwindling water resources. There's more in this report. Human activities like illegal mining, fishing with harmful chemicals and improper waste management are contributory factors to depreciation in water quality. Recent statistics reveal a significant decline in the quality of Ghana's water resources, depreciating from 86% to 58.8%. The executive director of Water Resource Commission, Dr. Bob Alpha, highlighted the reasons for this decline in water quality. Ghana's water resources is actually going down in terms of uh, the quality. Uh, we are having degradation of our water bodies due to land use activities as indicated in the morning. However, we also have some parts of Ghana where we have quite a lot of uh, good water resources. If you look at the Volta Basin system, all the way from the northern part of Ghana to Akosombo Dam, uh, the level of Galamse activities there is very minimal. So for some areas, we have good water quality. In other areas, we have bad water quality. That's the situation now. In 2005, we were around 86. So we had very good water resources uh, in terms of the percentage. Uh, then Galamse started, and then we started losing some of our rivers. Uh, the turbidity levels are very high. Uh, if we're able to fight Galamse and waste disposals, uh, I think we should be getting back to the same 86%. We are within the borderline. We are still a water secure country. However, we are classified as a water vulnerable country. We are very vulnerable when it comes to water resources. Uh, if we take the next steps to the left, then we will be going into a water insecure country. That's where we are. He gave possible solutions which could help curb the situation, mentioning that proactive measures aimed at reversing this trend must be pursued by stakeholders to ensure a sustainable future for all. We have to collaborate with other agencies. So we collaborate with the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, we collaborate with the EPA and other agencies to work together towards you know, eliminating this Galamse uh, menace. But it will take a while, it is a very difficult fight. Uh, it started long ago, uh, but we want everybody to be on board for the fight against Galamse. Bad fishing method, People using chemical, for instance, to, to fish. Uh, waste disposal is one of our biggest challenge. Uh, we all know how we dispose of our solid waste. And when it rains, uh, all that is washed into our rivers. So we are tackling the waste disposal issues with the assemblies, uh, the fish farming also with the Minister of uh, Fisheries. Uh, agriculture, farming along the river banks, you know, when that happens, uh, the fertilizer that we use can be washed into you know, our rivers and lakes. So we are collaborating with all these agencies to ensure we minimize the impacts of all these activities. World Water Day celebrates water and inspires action to tackle the global water crisis. A core focus of this day is to support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is water and sanitation for all by 2030. 
The Ghana Water Company is, however, bemoaning how the continuous galancy activities on the Pra and other rivers in the central region have left many homes in parts of the central and western regions without water. The company is warning that many more homes may be at risk if not of not getting water if the Galamsey activities are not completely dealt with. Speaking at a symposium organized at the University of Cape Coast, Deputy Managing Director of the company in charge of operations, Peter Devier, called for a genuine fight against anything that threatens the existence of any water body in the country. The Ghana Water Company has already cut 30% of its production at the Setrahiman Water Treatment Plant Due to the high turbidity levels of the Pra River, the company says the quality of water is being compromised on a daily basis and urgent steps must be taken to address the growing phenomenon, lest there would be a huge water scarcity. Deputy Managing Director of the company in charge of operations, Peter Dehier, lamented the expensive chemicals the company has had to use, coupled with the cost of replacing its equipment constantly due to the effect of Galamsey activities. As we all know, our water bodies must be protected. Anything that trans threatens the existence of any river body should be resisted at all costs, from what Prof has told us. So the company has now been compelled to adapt a more potent but expensive coagulant. This new treatment chemical is costing the company about four times the original cost of the first coagulant. And in spite of this high potency of these new treatment chemicals, the rising, still the rising levels of turbidity or the raw water is severely compromising the water quality and imposes substantial operational burden on GWC for the two treatment plants. The current high turbidity levels do not allow the full utilization of the full capacity of the plants. The Setrehiman and Dabwasi water treatment plants, like many others across the country, play critical roles in providing clean and safe drinking water for thousands of customers. In Setrehiman, the water treatment plant provides water for residents of Cape Coast and Elmina municipality, Cape Coast Metropolis and Elmina municipality. That of Dabwasi is also for second integrity. The detrimental effect of Galamse activities on the Prairie River continue to pose challenges to the efficient functioning of these water supply facilities. The levels of turbidity observed in the raw water of lead is about 800. 8,000. And this morning the figure is 11,000 to 13,000 NTU. Meanwhile, the plant was designed to handle NTU levels of only 800, 500 in 208. And that was the in 1969 when it was commissioned to designed to handle NTU levels of 54. So water production at Reheman Water Treatment Plant has now been cut down by 30% to forestall the transmission of unwholesome water into the distribution system. This has left many communities in Cape Coast and Mina without water for some time, especially those in the high hilly areas. In a similar vein, the abstraction of highly turbid water at Dabwasi often causes the breakdown of the pumping equipment. This has significantly reduced the quantity of water produced at the plant, also resulting in water shortages in part of the data credit. The financial burden imposed on the company by the abstraction and treatment of polluted water, to say the least, is staggering. The company spends high volumes of money on pump replacements, maintenance, dredging of raw water intake and the sums. Between the year 2008 and 2023, Ghana Water spent $4 million to replace original pumps at the Central Human Water Treatment Plant, which should have lasted for 25 years. We want to do that just when the pumps broke down because they were abstracting tepid, highly tepid water. A professor of chemistry at the University of Cape Coast, Professor Daniel Kofiesuman, says the country may be forced to import water in the near future if the issue of the destruction of the country's rivers and water bodies are not tackled head on. Even now we can't pay water bills. They are complaining. But where we have to import water, what will happen to us? And I don't your people will not get that water, money to buy that water. So action is now. What can we do as Ghanaians to go back to where we were when mining was down underground? You see, interesting is our mining is that the gold is locked up in a certain chemical. 
acylopyrite. So once you dig to pick the gold, and you remove those things from the gold, you leave that acetic out there. And once it rains, it dissolves that acid. Long before, they were using arsenic as pesticides. It was a very bad chemical. So you dig, once it's already down there, it doesn't come out. That's how God created the whole thing. Once it's locked up in there, the chemical arsenic doesn't come out. But once you go to pick the gold and you break it, you release those chemicals. And our water treatment doesn't solve that problem. So today we're having a lot of issues with kidney problems, all kinds of things. It's all because of what we are taking in into our body. Somebody is getting money from mining, and people are also suffering. The mining of Mankesim traditional area, Osajifu Amanfuidu, the fourth, called for some reforms in dealing with the Galamse menace. The symposium was organized as part of efforts to safeguard the country's water resources. Founder and leader of the Movement for Change, Mr. Alan Kweja Chairman Ting says he will make the Eastern region a hub for scientific research and technology innovation in the sub-region when he is given the opportunity to become president of Ghana. He says the initiative forms part of a broader agenda to attract some of the best science and technology resources into the country and beyond. Maxo Kudeko has more. Addressing the media in Kufuridia after his market tour in the eastern region. Mr. Chiramatin indicated that at least each region across the country would be developed to contribute significantly to national development. He says the eastern region will capitalize on its natural resources and proximity to greater Accra and greater Kumasi to handle scientific research and technology for national development. The Eastern Regional Market Tour gives Mr. Alan Kuduchre Martin the opportunity to interact with market women in seven major markets in the region, including Insawam, Adeiso, Asamankese, Akwitia, Kede, Suhum, and Kufoyudia. He believes the region is well positioned to harness the best science resource for the country and in the sub region. Because of the proximity, of the eastern region to both greater Accra and to the Ashanti region. My vision for this region is to build the region as the center of excellence for scientific research and technological innovation. And I think that if we, we focus on that in the future, we'll be able to attract some of the best uh, science and um, uh, research capacities and resource not only from Ghana or West Africa but from the whole world uh, to make this the, the hub for scientific research and innovation uh, for the for the subcontinent for the... Mr. Tramatin is also promising to establish the Traders Bank that will give soft loans to support traders and boost their living condition. The problem is that people are kind and I have a dear multiple job. So, as a matter of fact, a couple of things say, you have a chance in your partner. You have a chance in your partner. I say, it's a new modern market. You have a new market. You have a new modern market. Ah, that's it. Market in here, a whole lorry station, a whole clinic, a whole place to say, let's get all the money to bring us to town. You are talking to me, and you are going to have more. And it's a car, but it's a big car. And if you are the animal, it's a car, it's a car. It's a whole computer bank to be anywhere. It's a car, it's a big car. You pay, you have to say, you need more. Okay, 
Some traders in the eastern region have been sharing their opinions with John News. Reports by Maswo Kudeko for joining us. We're also live on Joy News. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll bring you business. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News Desk. With me, Pius Kujobaka, Associate Professor in International Sustainable Development Law at the University of Northampton, Dr. Ebenezer Lai, has highlighted the dangers of plastic much um, to food systems and health. Now, speaking to Joy Business at a stakeholder engagement event held by the university's Fresh Produce Impact Hub in Accra, Dr. Lai advocated for adopting sustainable mulching activities. Now, he emphasized the importance of considering the soil for future generations. Ghana faces a significant challenge with plastic waste, generating an estimated 840,000 tons annually. To address this challenge, the University of Northampton's Fresh Produce Impact Hub held a stakeholder discussion to engage key players in exploring research solutions being developed by the university and its partners. Dr. Ebenezer Laye, Associate Professor in International Sustainable Development Law at the University of Northampton, participated in a discussion highlighting the importance of collaborative effort to develop environmentally friendly alternative solutions. It will, will, will benefit immensely because it means um, that we can preserve uh, the soil fertility on our farming lands. Um, it means that uh, we also protect, help to protect our food security as well. Um, it also means that we can ensure that future generations of farmers are able to plant on the same lands that we are able to plant on uh, you know, at the moment. It also means that we uh, address the issue of microplastics in the soil, um, which uh, you know, of course has its own implications uh, in terms of uh, uh, the food chain. Uh, as well. And also there's economic benefits to this because uh, the fact of the matter is that if, 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 if our soil fertility uh, is damaged and our food security is damaged, we need to spend, it means, more money on uh, food, importing food from, from outside of the country. It applies pressure on our currency, which has inflationary effect as well. Simon Derrick is the head of sustainability at Blue Skies Holdings. Is to actually see how we can remove plastic mulch from farms. So if you don't know, plastic mulch is commonly used in pineapple farms, you know, a thin uh, layer of film which is applied uh, to the soil. It helps to retain moisture, it helps to suppress weeds, but of course you're left with plastic. Calling in a holistic mulch experiment, which is testing different materials, um, so the current plastic material um, uh, against the, uh, the coconut coir material, um, uh, and then looking at that compared to uh, a biodegradable material from CSIR in South Africa to see um, how they perform. 
you know, we think um, you know, th there, it, this is um, the first of its kind uh, project like this in the world, as far as we know. Um, so we're very excited uh, by this project. According to Alistair Jumate, the corporate affairs manager at Blue Skies, the project will help tackle plastic pollution. Having been in this industry for over 25 years, we've seen the damage and the impact of um, plastic use on our farms. Um, so we thought this is an avenue for us to join hands with equal minds, for us to find a more permanent solution to the rising challenge of plastic waste along the value chain in the agricultural sector. And for us, we think that this is the way forward for us to bring innovation into the area so that we'll be able to save the planet for generations after us. The Fresh Pack project is currently being funded by the UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office and is implemented in partnership with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. An animal welfare advocacy organization has raised concerns within the poultry industry about the increasing use of bird housing systems that restrict the movements, especially of egg laying hens. According to Director of Animal Welfare League, Daniel Abribaba, systems such as battery caging, unlike deep litter caging, limit the goal of producing organic products and harm the poultry products for consumption. Precious Emevo has more. According to the Animal Welfare League, an animal welfare advocacy organization, one of the factors that also threatens the poultry industry in Ghana is the caging of birds with the increasing importation of battery cages, especially for egg-laying hens. The system, unlike traditional methods or the new enriched cages, restricts hens' ability to perform natural behaviors and causes the birds to suffer high levels of stress and frustrations. Director of AWL Daniel Abeliba urged poultry farmers at a cage-free workshop in Sunyai to stick to the improved traditional housing systems for poultry farming to ensure safe products for consumption. The poultry industry in Ghana has been predominant predominantly produced in cage-free systems. But due to the ongoing ban of battery cages in other countries like um, some states in the US, UK and the, U the EU phasing out cages by 2030, it has become very easy for our local poultry farmers to have access to these um, battery cages. And that is why we think it, at this very initial point to create this awareness among farmers to know that if they adopt, if they buy and transition into battery cages, they'll be harming the welfare of the bears and then they'll be harming the very product that we um, give to consumers um, in the country. And our goal to produce organic products will be highly limited. National President of the Poultry Farmers Association, Victor Ponerje, advised members not to invest in cage systems while they look forward to a state policy to safeguard the welfare of birds. If you are getting 93% from the battery cage and looking at the investment that we have made and somebody is getting 90% from the deep litter system, it doesn't make any difference. So the, and the investment, of, as I have said already, is very high. If it becomes a policy from the government, there's nothing you can do about it. But as of now, we are just advising them not to go into it. But if somebody says, no, I like it, I have my money, I want to do it, you can't do anything. But when the policy comes, you have to stop it. Some farmers spoke to Joy Business. The deep litter has got a lot of benefits because it's less cost. Immediately you get your structure, uh, most of the item that you need to add to ensure that the farm is moving on is not as expensive as the, the, the caging system. So we to let us remain at our place and then uh, improve on what we are doing presently. It's also going to help me to actually increase uh, in my, on my uh, uh, production and then uh, profits. The cage-free workshop was on the theme improving poultry welfare and productivity in Ghana. Precious sum of a joy business, Sunyai. And that'll be all for business for now. I am Pius Kojo Baka. Back to you, Aisha. Thank you so much, Pius, for bringing us business. That's how we wrap up the bulletin this morning. My name is Aisha Rhyme. Log on to myjournline.com uh, for more of the news and updates for all the uh, developing stories. See you again at 12.